and he will be sharing with us some results and the best practice from the project reviews and also from the Dutch Green Deal. He will also update us with the most recent activities of the UNEP 10 YFP Working Group on Sustainable Public Procurement. After Dr. Mervyn Jones, we have Barbara van Offenbeck from Dutch the Dutch Ministry for Infrastructure and the Environment, who will bring us from the theory to actual implementation through um, the circular procurement approach to textiles and fashion. And last, we have Enrico de Jordis from the Environment from the European Commission, who will explain the role of circular economy in the ongoing green poly procurement work and the priorities for the next year. There will be some time for questions at the end of each presentation, so please do send any questions you have via the questions and answers chat or also via the private chat to the host, which is Igle Europe Web Conference. And my colleague, Juliana Longworth, she will forward them on to me and on the rest of the panelists. And of course, if you have any difficulties, please also let Igle Europe Web Conference know by private message and we will see what we can do to support you. So get started with the webinar. We have the first uh, speaker of the day, who is Dr. Mer Mervyn Jones. Um, I would like to pr make you presenter now, so you can start with your presentation when you please. Okay, thank you very much, Estella. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining the webinar. Um, so as Estella has just said, I will be talking for the next 15 minutes or so on the Rebus project. And Project Rebus is a European uh, commission an EU Life Plus project that's been running for about three and a half years now. It's coming to the end of its term and is just reporting now on the various different activities. Among those activities, it conducted over 30 pilots um, and this was across the supply chain. So some of those pilots were led by one of the main partners, the Dutch Rights Waterstat in the Netherlands, who looked at it from a public procurement perspective using demand pull to drive a change in the market for more circular goods and services. The other part of the project was to look from the supply side, so looking at the various different options from the business perspective about how different businesses in different categories and different sectors could actually start to use circular business models in their own businesses and in their own provision of goods and services to enable them to provide better services to their clients and their customers. And I'll give you some examples of these as, as I go through the project. Um, the, as you can see on the, uh, the, the, well, I say as you can see, if I can click through. Uh, sorry, if, if I can ask the organizers just to, to tell me how to click through. Hi, Mary. Your presentation is the number two. You find it in the top bar is the, uh, with the number two reboot. If you ah, click through it, then you can click lovely. through the slides. Lovely. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, this just shows you men and technology don't necessarily mix very well. So <laughs> um, as you can see from the, the, the slide at the bottom right hand side, you've got the Rebus website address. All the resources, for example, the how-to toolkit on the, is, is located on the website along with <clears throat> case studies uh, and reports around policy implications and around the different pilots. Um, sorry, I'm still just having a little bit of a problem in terms of clicking through. Um, If I could get some guidance on just how to, which button to press on the click through. Yes, sure. Um, it's just this um, buttons and the top bar. You select your presentation, and then there is two arrows, ah, left right. and right. Yeah, I've got I've got it now. It's working. I was clicking, but not there. So <laughs> if we move on to the presentation, then in terms of the circular economy, I, I hope many of you will be familiar with the general concepts. But a, a very simple si a slide just simply to, to show you the circular economy in action. What we've been traditionally doing is taking materials from Earth's resources. <clears throat> we've been making them into products along the blue line. We've been using those products and then we've been disposing of them into landfill. This is what various different commentators have called the take, make, use, dispose or the linear model. What we're trying to do 
with the circular economy is to bring that linear model into more of a loop so that we combine products, we combine the business models and the supply of those products with the demand for those products, what I've called demand pull here, and we bring those round and combine them into loops or into circles so that we end up with more circular goods and services. <clears throat> and the benefits of doing this are multiple. There are economic benefits, there are social benefits, and there are environmental benefits. And of course, the clear environmental benefits are that the more circular we can make products and materials, the more the less we have to take out of the ground in the first place and the less carbon we use in terms of making those goods and services and those products. In terms of the economic benefits, <clears throat> the Rebus project through the 30 different pilots has actually been able to look at the, the benefits on those pilots and scale those benefits up to what would what it would look like in terms of a European economy if all of those different models and those different benefits were realized not at a pilot project level but at the European economy level. And here you can see the total number is absolutely huge and it ties in very well. That 324 billion euros ties in very well with some of the forecasted and economically modeled predictions from the various different commentators, things like the Club of Rome, the Alan MacArthur Foundation, and all the various different economies who have put input into those different reports. So you can see on that slide, independent countries within the European member states, independent companies, countries within the Commission <coughs> have been looking at the benefits relative to their own country. So in all cases, GDP increases. Um, in all cases, jobs potentially increase, and in all cases, we're getting economic benefits as a result of those models being applied. Now, this slide is going to look a bit complicated, so I'll, I'll build it up, hopefully, uh, in stages. But really, in order to realize those economic benefits of the circular economy, to, to enable the environmental and the social benefits to follow through afterwards, it's simply a matter of matching supply with demand. And, and the critical factor that underpins supply and demand is quality. But the supply has to be sufficient quality to meet the demand, whether it's in the public sector, a business to business, or a, as a consumer, whatever we're asking for. And in order to do that, there are various different barriers to overcome. We need to have information about purchase and information about disposal. In terms of supply, we need to think about the evidence of what the supply side is. There are technological barriers there. And if we're moving away from a linear model, we need to take out the risk to de-risk, but also to incentivize investment in those new models. And in doing that, what we then do is build infrastructure that enables more collection and sorting of materials and products at end of first life. And then we need to encourage markets for secondary materials. Now that sounds like a lot, but actually within the European directives, particularly the Waste Framework Directive, we are in fact doing a lot of this already. So really this circular economy is about making this happen, accelerating the change more quickly. And there are various different interventions, if you like, that we can do. To de-risk, we can provide support to businesses directly through state aid. We can incentivize through the use of different financial mechanisms. We can look to prevent waste. We can look to use procurement as a mechanism. And this is where the role, not just of ourselves as consumers or as businesses comes in, but the role of the public sector comes into play here. We can use public sector procurement in particular to start encouraging those markets for secondary materials and to do things like start to influence the design for circularity in goods and services and to set specifications and standards that encourage better quality and supply of materials back into that market.
And again, hopefully some of you will be familiar with this slide. In the top right hand side, you'll see the waste hierarchy, starting with waste prevention through reuse into recycling and composting, energy recovery, and then finally at the bottom, disposal. If we look to link the procurement hierarchy with the waste hierarchy, we can see that there's a very close fit. So at the top of the procurement hierarchy, we have rethinking the need. In other words, do we actually need to buy something? Do we need to own it? Do we need lamps and luminaires or do we just need lights? Do we need to own a car or do we just need mobility? So we need to rethink the need and we can use procurement if we're early enough in the planning stage to rethink the need. We can also reduce, we can reuse, we can recycle and we can encourage energy recovery. So the procurement hierarchy and the waste hierarchy are very similar. And there are a number of different actions in terms of the procurement hierarchy and here's just a few examples. But typically when we're thinking about sustainable public procurement, we focus very strongly on the purchasing. What circular uh, procurement, if you like, is starting to do is to encourage the purchasers and also the budget holders and the policy makers to think about the procurement choices, not just around purchasing, but also how the product or the service is used and how it's disposed of at end of first life. And I keep saying end of first life very deliberately because when we've finished with, say, an article of clothing or when we've finished with a building or when we've finished with a vehicle, we don't tend to throw it straight into landfill. There are other people, there are other options in terms of reuse. So if we're thinking about purchasing, for example, we can think about in the context of building specifications to increase recycled content within buildings. If we're thinking about use, we can think about lower carbon impacts, for example, the shared use of buildings or perhaps designing buildings for more flexible use so that we can increase the utilization rates of those buildings, typically only about 20 to 40 percent in the public sector in Europe. And also about the disposal options. So when our building is completed, what happens to it at end of life? Can we sell that building on? Can it be refurbished for some other use or does it have to be demolished? And if it's demolished, can we actually bring the materials from that demolished building back into the new build? So we're using our assets more efficiently. And again, this is just a very quick and simple slide that shows you that using procurement principles in terms of specifications and encouraging the market to accelerate the delivery of circular products and services, we can encourage better design for products that enable us to reuse or to remanufacture at end of life. We can reduce wastage in the manufacturing process. We can be better consumers of those products. And we can also, as policymakers, encourage infrastructure that enables more reuse and more recycling at end of life. And here's an example, just a very quick one, I won't go through in any detail, but using the um, 2016, uh, which should all now be transposed into national <coughs> members' um, regulations, the, the EU procurement directive, using best price quality ratio as part of the most economically advantageous tendering process. So BPQR, best price quality ratio, and if you look here at this example from the Netherlands, from one of the Rebus projects and the Dutch Green Deal project, you can see down here the emphasis and how strong an emphasis there is on encouraging the suppliers, the tenderers, to come up with solutions that conform with a more circular product delivery at, end of, um, uh, uh, at the tendering stage. So combining the, the vision of the client with the vision of the supplier, looking at how the actual solution then enables a circular economy to be represented within that procurement project. So again, a very strong link between circular procurement and between um, the, uh, the, the circular economy. And 
again, this is perhaps one of the biggest barriers in some senses to the linear model is the fact that there are there is so much choice. There are so many different types of circular business model, but that's also a huge strength. It's a great strength because there are models that are available for short cycle, for short term projects, for long term projects. There are different types of models, uh, resource efficient business models, alternative business models to the linear economy. And very simply put, they're either servicization models. Instead of buying something, you're buying a service, you're purchasing a service. If you are purchasing something, you have an option to sell it back to the original supplier, or the third type of group of models is that you have the option to sell on to somebody else, so buy and sell on. So you can summarize these really quite simply down into three options, serviceization, take back, or sell on. Now, just very quickly looking at uh, some examples here just to show you that this circular procurement approach works for lots of different categories is catering and food waste. If you're looking at circular procurement principles in food and catering waste, it's really about preventing waste. The amount of carbon in food and the amount of waste produced, over 45% of waste is produced from plate waste in the UK in particular, but a lot of waste is produced within overcooking or over preparing in the kitchen area and also waste in terms of spoilage and linking that in with the dietary requirements can enable a better social outcome because you're getting a healthier population for citizens particularly when you're talking about um, catering into schools so focusing on waste prevention in catering in electricals, really options around design uh, may be limited because we're talking about global supply chains, but there are options, for example, to specify laptops, computers with recycled content in them to encourage markets for recycled plastics. But also a lot of options when we're talking about either mobile phones for modularity or for computers for modularity to look at changing the design of those pieces of equipment so that they can be upgraded more simply and their functional life can be extended. So end of life options around collection for reuse rather than for recycling are really quite important. And we've got some great examples on the Rebus website from the Netherlands through the Public Procurement and Green Deal program. In terms of furniture, furniture again, uh, particularly when we're talking about office chairs and desks lend themselves to be potentially very circular as products. However, at the moment, there's a high degree for improvement. And again, we've got some great examples here with ProRail in the Netherlands using both circular furniture, using reuse options. So they, in, in the ProRail, when they were refitting a brand new traffic or rail control system, uh, an office for 350 desks, if I remember correctly, around a third of those they were able to use existing furniture. And then for carpets, for floor tiling, they were able to look at um, service models that incorporated the maintenance and servicing over a 10 year period for those carpets, which enabled the manufacturer then to be able to take back that material and to reuse or to recycle it. And again, construction, a fantastic example here in terms of the building you see in the top right hand corner, not just looking at extending product lives indefinitely, but looking at matching the product lifetime to the need of a client. So in this town hall where they didn't know that they necessarily had the need for the building extension for 150 desks beyond 20 years, they've designed a modular extension building that is fit for purpose for 20 years it could go on for longer but if not all the components in that building can be disassembled and reused elsewhere so it's a truly circular building and again when we're talking about infrastructure projects there's a lot of resource efficient business models around ownership around design build fund maintain and operate that enable circular outcomes particularly when we're thinking about infrastructure projects about large volumes and huge masses of aggregate and inert materials which although have low carbon content when they add up with the amount of material used they become very significant in carbon terms so there's just a few examples um, looking forward we've got <coughs> in the Netherlands um, a project is coming up that's going to be tendered fairly shortly 
called um, Innova 58, and it's the Reichsvolta stat, and they're looking for a 100% circular, totally circular design for a, a piece of highway and for two junctions there. So again, it's about using public procurement to actually push forward to accelerate the process of delivering the circular economy. And this summary slide shows you various different options here if you're looking at different services and the amount of impact that adopting those various different options and actions can actually do in terms of increasing, or I should say reducing, the um, environmental impacts there. So to summarize then, the core learning from the Rebus project has been engaged with the market. Um, but before you do that, you need to understand what it is that you want as a consumer, as a, as a uh, procurer. So internal collaboration between the procurement function, between the budget holders and the policy makers is critical. Using most economically advantageous tendering to its best in order to promote life cycle costing and best price quality ratio it is also a, a very useful tool. And collaboration is absolutely key to making sure that we can deliver the circular economy outcomes to the best of their ability. So at this point, I'll leave it to you to come back to me with any questions. If you haven't got any questions now, you can see uh, email addresses and website addresses. So please go and find further information or please contact us direct and we'll do our best to help you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mervyn Jones, uh, speaking, uh, doing the introduction to Circular Procurement. I really thought the examples were very inspiring, and I hope uh, they were true for the participants of the webinar. Um, we do have some questions, uh, but I can encourage the, the rest of the audience to send and submit uh, the questions to either um, the panelists directly or the host. And uh, the question would be um, referring, going back to, uh, through your slides, uh, in one of your slides, it seemed to be uh, what well, you, you were speaking about the different circular business models, that there were a lot of different uh, alternatives to linear uh, models. And uh, for instance, a uh, solution would be to use more functional specifications instead of very descriptive specifications. And the question would be, what are, in your experience, the most common barriers that procurers find when trying to move towards more functional specifications? How, how do you think that they could over be overcome? Uh, thank you, Estella. That's, um, it's a very good question. It's a very simple question with a very complex answer. Uh, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of barriers. If the circular economy and procurement was able to deliver circular economy outcomes easily, we'd all be doing it. And it's not as easy as it looks. The most, probably the most significant risk from my personal experience is business as usual is a model that people know works. So it's all about risk. Uh, whether you're an architect designing a building, you use certain materials. You've got many materials available to you, but you use certain materials because you know how they perform and you know what works and what doesn't work. So people, whether we're in procurement or whether we're in design or whether we're in policy making, we tend to go with what we've learned and what we've done before. So business as usual, moving, whether uh, it's a business model or whether it's a policy or whether it's a, a, a procurement tender, whether to move away from that original uh, tender, to move away from what we did before, is there's a risk there. And often that risk is a perceived risk rather than a real risk. And if I go back to that slide right at the beginning with the supply and the demand, you can see that there are many factors involved. There might be technical barriers or there might be information barriers, and that's probably the second biggest barrier, is the lack of information. It's not that there isn't information available, it's just often, particularly when we're doing procurements, the information isn't available at the right time of making decisions or to the right person who has to make those decisions. So again, that's why internal collaboration is really important. And then the third risk, I guess, the third barrier, that I would have to mention is that often when we're talking about public procurement, the financial systems that are in place can often act as a barrier. So whether we're talking about shifting money from a capital budget into an operational or a revenue-based budget, if we're talking about a leasing model, 
it may be that the systems and processes that we've got in place are actually stopping us from doing what looks like being common sense. And this is where the examples on the Rebus website and, and certainly the work that the Dutch government has done through its Green Deal program have really tested those perceptional barriers and where they've come up against real process barriers, they've actually gone forward and looked to address those through changes in their regulation, their national regulation and through changes in their policy. Okay, thank you for, for your answer. I do agree that um, that we, are, we don't like risk, no? we don't like taking risk and I think in public procurement even less you know, because it's public money and it's uh, well the risks are so you, I think you're very right uh, talking about collaboration and how to really address uh, this risk and try to overcome them. I think that's really key. We so have think, another. Sorry. sorry, I was just going to say just very quickly to come back on that. The the the, the way to do that, in in my experience, then is to incentivise to make it relevant to the person who we're trying to change their behaviour. So incentivise them, whether it's showing them the economic benefits or the environmental benefits or the job benefits. Okay, thank you. We got a uh, question from the uh, audience as well, and I think well the question is well what about local and uh, local materials and natural materials? I'm not sure if it means about um, how to to make sure that the materials are in the well in a circular way used and re uh, reused or recycled. Uh, maybe from the chat someone can specify, or maybe you understood it better than I did. Well, I I. I understand it from a certain perspective and, and to give an example in Scotland and again in construction is Scotland produces a lot of aggregates so part of our economy is based on the production of virgin aggregate so you know you might look at it from a national perspective and say this is this is really not a, a good idea if we're encouraging the, um, yeah, the use of secondary materials However, I'd respond to that by saying, you know, when you look at the jobs benefits, the additional benefits of creating reuse after the use of first life, you, you end up with more jobs available to the economy. You end up with more money flowing around. And yes, you're displacing virgin, but you're also, you're not displacing all of the virgin. So you, you've got a, a market that's actually more resilient because it's based not just on virgin material production, often coming from other countries, but not exclusively, but also it's based on local uh, reuse production, remanufacturing. Most reuse and remanufacturing goes on at a local level. So the jobs benefits tend to be a net positive when you're thinking about recycling and reuse at a local level compared to extracting virgin materials. Hopefully that was that, that's one way of looking at that question anyway. Uh, it makes sense to me. <laughs> I hope uh, we, we did get it right. Uh, okay, I think we're running out of time. Um, we still have a question from the chat. Um, I'm going to allow it, but please, if anyone else has a question, I, I would ask you to uh, ask this and we'll, well, we'll forward them to the panelists at the end of the, of the session if it's time. The last question here is, is, what changes do you see in the international market? when you apply to the principles of circular economy? What, what changes? Uh, I, I think just very simply to go back to that last answer is that the changes are that it gives an opportunity to really expand the economy by looking at more local production in secondary markets, in, in reuse and remanufacturing. So thinking about reuse and remanufacturing of chairs that tends to happen at a local level. Um, it, it's about resilience. So we've, we've done a report uh, looking in terms of a strategy across Europe about the policy implications of the circular economy and that's on the website. One of those is about helping to contribute to resilience within the economic region. So whether you're in North America, whether you're in Europe or wherever, you, know, you can create more resilience by focusing more locally on keeping materials moving around the local economy more than relying on a global marketplace. And as we see in by 2030, we're going to have two thirds of the world's population in that middle income bracket. Um, and yeah, you know, that's going to create an excessive demand on what is a finite set of commercially viable resources. You know, there are a, an infinite amount of resources available to us, but to actually utilize those on a commercially viable basis is not realistic within that time scale. So we're going to have a lot of pressure on resources. So the more that we can actually 
keep those resources moving around our own European economy, I think the more resilient we'll be to those global fluctuations in the future. Okay, many, many thanks for your introduction and for answering the questions. I'm not saying goodbye because I know you come back uh, in a later session, so bye by now. And uh, moving on with this webinar, uh, our next panelist is Barbara van Offenbeck, who works at the Dutch Ministry for Infrastructure and Environment. And she's going to explain us today how the principles that we have heard before can be implemented, this time in the field of textiles and fashion. So Barbara, your turn, please. Yes, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, the, the girl on the image is not me, uh, it's just a, a mark uh, that we use for the project of ACAP, so uh, <laughs> uh, that's what I wanted to warn you. Uh, I would really like to thank you for your interest in this uh, webinar, all, uh, all, all participants. And um, uh, well, my name is Barbara, I work for uh, Rijkswaterstaat, that's the executive uh, uh, agency of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment. And um, uh, I'm a senior consultant and my main tasks are helping projects in infrastructure and textiles to work on circular approach in combination with the green public procurement. Uh, Estelle, just one question. Um, uh, it's okay if I just start right now? Should I continue or should we uh, do something else? Estelle? I was saying continue that we, that we listen. I'm not right, digital okay. camera. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I was telling uh, about a project in infrastructure and textiles to work on circular approach in combination with green public procurement. And I also work in a European project, the European Clothing Action Plan, which is called ECAP. Um, this is a European project that promotes the recycling of textiles, reducing new raw materials, water, chemicals and energy. And within ECAP, Rijkswaterstaat is working with the British organization RAP, the Danish Fashion Institute, the Dutch-British organization Made By and the London Waste and Recycling Board. For this project, we produced a report on workwear, and in this webinar, I will give the highlights of the reports and will show how governments can help stimulate or influence circularity textiles in Europe. Um, these are the partners um, uh, for you uh, uh, in logo form. For uh, each ECAP project, we, uh, Rijkswaterstaat, we take care of three sub actions, which is the public procurement action. Uh, the fiber to fiber recovery and the increasing clothing recovery rates. The fiber to fiber recovery uh, action is really on uh, pilots, running pilots with uh, using uh, uh, recycled post consumer material. And in the clothing recovery re re rates, we look at ways to uh, collect more textiles in, uh, in uh, urban uh, cities. Um, uh, this is the, um, the um, uh, you can see in this um, uh, circle, all the steps that we are taking in this uh, plan. Um, um, you can see, uh, well, we think that a circular economy in Europe can provide as many extra. Uh, an estimated 600 billion euros of economic value and crucial contribution to reducing the environmental impact of our own, uh, of our production and consumption. And with, the, uh, with this clothing action plan for the circular economy, we work on integrated action across design, production, consumption, and waste management. Governments can do much to strengthen this movement. And for instance, through procurement of goods such as workwear and textiles. In the, uh, the ECA project, all partners are responsible for one of the work packages described in the figure above. And we are all working together to create a circular approach towards textiles in Europe by developing and sharing knowledge and create a large network with everyone that wants to join us in order to realize the circular economy benefits. Might you be interested in also taking part? Then please um, uh, come to our website, the ECAP website, and uh, you can inscribe us. Uh, more specific targets of this project are to reduce the uh, carbon, wa water and waste footprints of clothing in Europe, uh, to ensure that fewer low-grade textiles go to incineration and to landfill, prevent waste in clothing supply chain, encourage innovation in resource-efficient design, recycling of textiles fibers, and service models to encourage business growth in the sector, and to influence consumers to buy smarter, 
and use clothing for longer by using the existing Love Your Clothes Consumer uh, campaign. Um, now, if we go to the um, um, to the report I was referring about, um, 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 in the chain of workwear, all kinds of uh, um, uh, market participants are involved to make workwear circular, and they will all have to make changes in their business and production process. Also in the public sector, many people, including buyers, budget holders and decision makers, are involved in the procurement of workwear and textiles. Moreover, it's regulated differently in all Europe, European countries. And to achieve circular workwear, everyone must contribute, and which is a really big challenge, actually. Um, especially in the public sector, uh, results can relatively quickly be achieved. Governments buy many workwear and influence through their purchasing power its sustainability. For example, by using purchasing criteria for the amount of recycled textile fibers, sustainable design or recycling options. And they can also involve users and suppliers in the collection and processing of discarded workwear or even work with other business models such as leasing. And that really helps. Um, the more workwear returns, the easier and efficient recycling will become. Um, in um, the, the actions for the public procurement, we are going to, uh, well, we, 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 we have um, uh, produced this market report. Uh, besides that, we want to develop criteria for procurement of workwear. Uh, we also will uh, organize five masterclasses in Europe for suppliers and procurers of workwear. And we develop and share knowledge to stimulate sustainable workwear. Um, um, in the report, um, sorry. Uh, yes, there it is. One moment. That went too fast. Sorry. Sorry for this. Uh, in the report, you will find a description of the context of workwear within the European Union. It identifies challenges and opportunities for public sector procurement to contribute to a more circular e uh, European economy. And besides all kinds of practical recommendations for making the textile sector more circular, the ECAP report also gives examples from Denmark, Poland and the Netherlands, such as recyclable clothing for the Lux Stewards at Rijkswaterstaat. These examples demonstrate that reuse and a high quality destination of the fibers can yield good business cases. The more government agencies lead to by example and uh, lead by example and start with circular procurement of clothing, the more parties will follow within the chain. And for, for suppliers, it will then become normal to offer other customers also workwear with recycled material. Well then, um, first, um, let's have a look at what we're talking about in terms of va um, uh, value of workwear in Europe. For 2015, 8.6 billion of contract awards for textiles and workwear were made across the uh, 28 European countries. Um, mean, um, um, you, uh, you have to know that this only reflects contracts published above the relevant European threshold uh, value, so therefore this is probably an underestimation. The figure shows that outside of non-specific categories, health, defense, and the emergency services account for the largest individual procurement services for the textiles and clothing. That was the value thing. Then when we look at the waste side of the, of the uh, workwear, uh, we know that each year about uh, 93 million kilograms of workwear is being purchased in Europe. And we also know that this means that we also throw away millions of kilos of workwear and textiles each year. And unfortunately, there are um, uh, no published figures on workwear waste available to this report. Um, it is assumed post-production waste levels for workwear are similar across uh, uh, Euro Euro all Europe. Um, European and ECAP partner country waste levels uh, per, per annum for workwear are estimated on a 12%. All this is a very, uh, um, um, uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, many public authorities and public organizations use workwear, but most of them don't have any policy for reuse or recycling of materials. 
So most clothing is destroyed because of security risks and then goes to landfill or be incinerated. This is a very uh, uh, missed opportunity because if you look at the environmental um, effects of textiles, it appears that textiles is a very interesting subject for uh, public organization when they, when they want to reduce the environmental impact of their purchases. Compared to other consumer goods, they have a significant effect on the, uh, on the environment. And this figure is uh, uh, showing this really uh, very clearly. Uh, looking at um, the regulatory drivers that help to stimulate sustainability in textiles, we see several possibilities at several levels. Of course, there's the European regulatory and legislation in the field of security and social circumstances and also environmental impact. National governments can complete these with national regulatory and legislation. And besides the economic drivers, we see an interesting trend of voluntary drivers in which gov uh, like sectoral agreements. An example is the Dutch textile covenant in which government made an, uh, um, an agreement with several parties and representatives from the textile sector to become more circular and more sustainable. And this is really help helping because um, the voluntarily uh, uh, driver um, really um, uh, reaches more than, um, than policy making. Uh, you see that uh, companies are really willing to change their uh, company's policy. Um, looking at the, uh, the current practice uh, of uh, workwear in uh, Europe, um, um, uh, we have, uh, we have to, uh, to conclude that the level of sustainability and circularity is at this moment not very impressive for workwear. Um, for the report, we compared the situation for work in the northern and western European countries. And um, uh, what we saw was that, um, for example, in the UK, that sustainability is, um, is more at a voluntary best practice level than that it's really a part of standards for, for textiles. It's not the case for all parts in the UK. For example, Wales shows more ambition for sustainability in their uh, governmental buying standards. However, circular workwear is not a priority yet. Um, in the UK, most of the workwear waste is exported either for reuse or recycling, and the economic value of it is in, uh, almost entirely based on the reusable component. Branded workwear has its specific problems since the branded items form a barrier for reuse and the cost to remove them are almost higher than its rest value. So this is quite difficult and uh, uh, a problem that uh, uh, workwear is facing um, uh, in all countries actually. Um, uh, uh, a slight, uh, slightly different uh, approach towards uh, sustainability and procurement we see in the Nordic countries. Um, for example, Denmark uh, has its attention focused on simplifying procedures and facilitating negotiations between contracting entity and bidders. They really encourage innovative solutions and alternate business models based on life cycle costing. Uh, they also look at uh, certification to guarantee sustainability and use it as a minimum requirement for procurement. Um, what they also do is they help companies achieving certification for eco-labels. And they uh, started some uh, pilots also with circular procurement for textiles. Another country which is really, uh, which is rather interesting uh, to look at when it comes to procurement of the textiles is the Netherlands. Uh, in the Netherlands, you see that um, the governmental goals to achieve uh, sustainable procurement is about 100%. Um, what they have done is they use, um, make use of category management uh, for uh, uh, procurement of several product groups. What they do is that they make um, one ministry responsible for the purchase of all uh, products of one group. So the benefit is that they have a really large uh, quantity uh, to, to, to purchase and they um, can also implement their sustainable goals uh, specifically for one product group. And it, uh, that really, um, uh, we can see um, that this really helps us uh, getting um, textile more sustainable. 
we, uh, our policy is also focused on encouraging market innovation um, to improve sustainability. And, um, uh, and it targets public bodies to develop their own sustainable procurement policies and, and, and really ensure that they are linked through procurement implementation. Functional specification, uh, Mervyn also mentioned it, is a really uh, helpful instrument um, to, uh, to challenge the market uh, to, to offer more sustainable solutions. And um, uh, we have also run several pilots to stimulate circularity in workwear. Uh, speaking of which, um, I will uh, explain some. Uh, I will give you two examples of the pilots we ran here in um, in Holland. Um, one of them is a pilot for the um, for our lock stewards. Lock stewards are uh, the the people who um, assist boats when they come to a lock and um, uh, help us uh, help them uh, pass through. Um, the, um, uh, we, uh, the, the Dutch government aspiration was to achieve a maximum reuse and recycling in this uh, project. And uh, 50 lock stewards were issued with caps, polo shirts, raincoats and fleece jackets made of 100% recyclable polyester materials, which were taken back at the end of the season. The pilot project's goal was to determine whether the whole idea of manufacturing, breaking down and then remanufacturing makes ecological and economic sense on a broader scale. The pilot has delivered a performance-based contract with Dutch Awareness in which the supplier continues to own the clothing and used clothing is returned to the supplier to be recycled. Um, the rainwear material can be reused thanks to Infinity, a 100% recyclable polyester which is shredded into fibers which can be used then in new clothing for the next season. And although the raincoats were recyclable, the material retrieved from the process was not enough to make new raincoats, so additional material had to be added. Now, the fleece jackets, however, and the polo shirts were fully recyclable and also turned into bags. Um, this was a very uh, successful um, uh, pilot, actually. All of the clothing was, was recycled. And um, uh, we will continue to do this uh, for uh, a couple of uh, more years. Another pilot we ran was by the Ministry of uh, Defence. Um, in order to assess the opportunities available, this ministry consulted the market by way of a request for information. One of the aims was to see whether the market could introduce a requirement for suppliers to include recycled fibers in certain new products. When the research showed that this was a viable option, existing policies were rewritten to reflect new and more functional starting points. For example, at least 10% of products must be made from recycled fibers and suppliers must be able to show this through examination under a microscope. The first phase of this project started with four items, towels, flannels, scarves, and overalls. The result was a four-year contract uh, that was awarded and that will supply the Ministry of Defense with 100,000 white and green towels, 10,000 washcloths, and around 53,000 green overalls. The new Okay, um, I can see that I'm running a bit out of time. I will um, finish this pilot. I will just uh, <laughs> tell something uh, about the pilot and then um, uh, go over to my recommendations, okay? Perfect. Um, I saw, an, um, I saw a, a question. Uh, do you want to answer me um, uh, the question right now or uh, shall I do it afterwards? As you wish, we have a few questions. Um, if you finish quickly, then we can ask them. Otherwise, uh, we're going to have to do the questions very quickly because we're running out of time. All right. Um, well, uh, what I wanted to say was um, 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 that the, um, the bid was quite successful and the, that uh, the new textiles include a high proportion of recycled material um, uh, from 36% uh, and 40% respectively. Um, and the parties are also uh, being encouraged to innovate over the term of the contract. So the proportion of the recycled material may increase even over time. 
And meanwhile, uh, there was also an eight-year reuse contract signed for the sorting for the reuse of 750,000 items of military uniforms and equipment each year. The clothing is sorted by hands by people who are out of the labor market, which helps the ministry to meet its social aims. Any clothing which is still suitable is reused within the military, saving the Ministry of Defense a great deal in procurement costs. Um, I will now, uh, well, these were the pilots. Uh, the circular procurement uh, principles, Mervyn already uh, said something about this as well. Um, the, the main uh, thing that I wanted to recommend is really uh, think about all the steps that are necessary to really work circular and that you really uh, need this collaboration through all these parties involved because otherwise uh, it's very uh, hard to achieve your circular goals. Um, looking at the, the recommendations I would like to give the audience is um, uh, government procure, uh, procurement bodies really have a significant demand pool potential within the workwear garment sector, so please use it. And uh, sectoral approaches have successfully demonstrated the potential for voluntary agreements to close the material loop, so please uh, look for collective action as well. And um, as, as, uh, uh, further research is really required to identify and understand better the more detailed stakeholder relationships and potential of influence across the different work, uh, workwear categories. Um, what is really uh, uh, our, our pilots really learned is that you really have to communicate clearly about your circular ambitions to the market very early to enable them to innovate in their design, manufacture and supply. Um, and when you uh, adopt uh, national procurement strategies like this category plan and, uh, that, we really, that we published, uh, uh, that is really uh, that that can provide you the the framework and the scope and the skill for collaboration within the supply chain. Um, what you? Um, I think we're going to have to yes. to stop it here, Barbara. I know yes, that that's you okay. uh, uh, the, 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 you happily uh, will will share the presentation afterwards. Um, people. Um, We'll be able to get through it and get your contact details as well. I hope you're okay yes. that people contact you in case they have other questions. I would like to very quickly um, ask um, two questions. The first questions that came to the chat. I'm sorry that we're not we don't have the time to go through all the questions, but please, you're going to have the contacts, uh, the contact details from Barbara in the presentation. So please, if you have any questions, she will be happy to uh, support you with them. The question that I, uh, the first question that came into the chat is um, whether you have made any experiences with cotton, with sub substitution for cotton. Yes, uh, we do. Uh, of course, there are many uh, offers uh, like bamboo or uh, uh, other natural uh, based fibers, um, which is of course um, it, it could be um, um, it could give a less environmental impact um, uh, compared to cotton. Um, but we uh, do not know for sure how um, how uh, appropriate it will be for uh, circular workwear. So we have no experience yet, uh, for example, with the bamboo uh, fibers. Um, if this uh, will be able to be reused again after um, after the end of life, um, and uh, a very um, um, What's, what's also important during um, uh, when you uh, are uh, making a bid is that you don't ask for recycled content, but really ask for the um, post-consumer material. So really use fibers, uh, cotton fibers or textile fibers to make textile again. Otherwise, uh, you will always uh, they will always uh, offer you um, the recycled plastic um, uh, fibers. Uh, which is really a very big uh, threat to the environment because washing your clothes um, makes really these microplastics um, uh, come free. So um, uh, you should really be, uh, take, take, uh, be aware of uh, what you're asking uh, for in your bid. Thank you very much, Barbara. And the second question 
is um, did the report identify some best practices in other member states that have successfully implemented circular public procurement practices uh, in addition to, to the Netherlands? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Were there other, other examples uh, of work where in a procuring work where in a circular way, which is not only in the Netherlands, which is, has happened in other countries? I think in uh, uh, Denmark there are uh, also some uh, pilots run with recycled fibers. And um, um, an another one in Poland, but that's not with uh, recycled fibers, but it was the whole uh, business model that um, uh, uh, that 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 the supplier also uh, took care of the washing and the re uh, the, the repairing uh, and the remanufacturing um, aspects. So the whole that was the whole surface of um, wearing workwear was um, was put in the hands of the supplier, which Excellent. were all very successful um, uh, pilots. That's very good to know. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, really. And really, in, in the report, there's so much information uh, about this, uh, so many recommendations and practical uh, guides. So I would really recommend to, to read the report because it will really help you, I think. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the tip. I think um, the links uh, to the work that Barbara has already presented uh, will be shared on, uh, together with the presentation and a recording of this webinar in, I guess, in the Rebus webpage, probably also in the main ECAP webpage and also in ECLA's Sustainable Procurement Platform. So yeah. for people that would like to get more information, you have the possibilities that we just mentioned. Uh, we're sorry that we couldn't uh, answer all your questions on time. So many, many thanks, Barbara. Uh, we're going to have to leave you here and move on to our next speakers. Who is, um, we're going, moving back to Mervin. He's going to update us briefly on UNEP's working group for C on sustainable public procurement. So please, Mervin, um, if you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Estella. And um, hello, everybody, again. Uh, to anybody who's just joined the webinar, uh, welcome to the webinar. And this is just going to be a short presentation on the 10-year framework program working group 4C which is all about promoting resource efficient business models and the circular economy. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the 10-year framework program there's lots of information on the uh, UNEP sustainable consumption and production website uh, and it works across a number of different themes but I'll just concentrate on one of its themes which is sustainable public procurement program. And as you can see on the slide in front of you, the aims of the SPP program is to build the case for more sustainable public procurement by improving the knowledge, addressing those knowledge barriers that I was talking about earlier in the previous presentation, um, and using SPP as a tool to promote sustainable consumption and production. And that goes hand in hand with delivering a more circular economy and all the economic and the environmental and the social benefits that come about as a result of a more circular economy. Its other aim is about supporting the implementation of SPP around the regions in the world and that very uh, small graphic at the bottom of the slide shows you just some of the, I think it's now 112 different members of the SPP program uh, across the globe. So we have people in the webinar from China who are also part of the SPP program. We have people from South America, from Africa, as well as from North America and from Europe and Australasia. In terms of the working groups, the SPP program has a number of different working groups and um, the working group objective for working group 4C is around circular economy and more resource efficient business models. So again, if you uh, were able to listen to my earlier presentation, it links in very closely with the work that um, the partners in the UK and in the Netherlands have been doing on the EU Life Rebus project. Um, but the working group objective over the last 18 months has been to broaden its approach uh, to SPP, to, to look about how sustainable public procurement can deliver more actively and the circular economy benefits that have been forecast in a number of different reports now through the likes of the Alan MacArthur Foundation, uh, Club of Rome, etc. But also to, to look at actually turning those conceptual forecasts 
into practice using public procurement as a driver. So to integrate innovative, circular, resource efficient business models into everyday public procurement practice as well as into policy. Uh, and the longer term goal there is also to develop it leadership and to link through to other forums, uh, whether they're sustainable public procurement, circular economy, life cycle costing forum, so that the working group has uh, some kind of legacy uh, beyond the 18 months because we're coming to an end. So um, in terms of background, it's worth just going back one step. The working group is led by the Dutch government uh, and that's because they have implemented a policy since 2010 of integrating circular economy principles into the delivery of government and in particular in procurement through the procurement of goods and services. And that came about because they were partners with the United States Environmental Protection Agency uh, under Working Group 3A, which was looking very closely at integrating product service systems, which are one type of resource efficient business model. Uh, they were looking at integrating product service systems into sustainable public procurement. And there is a report there, you can see the link and you can access that through the, um, the Clearinghouse uh, portal of the SPP programme. But what they, what they came to the conclusion, and it wasn't a particularly difficult conclusion, was serviceization is just one opportunity. It's, it's a big opportunity, but it's just one opportunity. And it isn't necessarily inherently sustainable if you don't actually specify and make sure you're procuring it correctly. So the Dutch government were very keen to link that in with their own policy development and their own delivery of their own policy to create and work with ICLE and with the United Nations Environment Programme and KITI, who are the, the, the three core pillars of the 10-year framework programme, to work together to create a, a better model, a, a wider, a more inclusive framework for sustainable public procurement in the circular economy. And the elements that they've used within the working group are to focus on implementation, so not just producing uh, guidance and reports, although that's very important, but also to, to look at the practicalities of, of embedding those information, uh, those data and the practices into public procurement practice. Um, and they've done this by developing a support package and working with pilots with pioneering city councils, uh, Barcelona and Turin, Barcelona in uh, the, the Catalan region of Spain and Turin in northwest Italy. Uh, and then also rolling out further elements, which I'll explain very briefly. So the training package consists of uh, a number of different, sorry, the, the, the outputs of a working group consist of a number of different uh, activities. Um, as, alongside the training package at the top there, you can see uh, the Dutch government as part of its presidency of the European Council uh, initiated last year the first International Circular Procurement Congress in um, Amsterdam. And that was, that, unfortunately, that was limited to uh, a, a very small group of people, but it was about 150 people from around the globe. And what we're looking now, uh, I think, in conjunction with the European Commission and also with UNEP again, the Dutch government is now looking to, to take that forward through another um, Circular Economy Congress later this year, uh, which will be in October in Tallinn, in Estonia. Now, in terms of the package itself, uh, there's a, a variety of different levels, and I, I won't read out everything there, but you can see um, if we move forward, I think, into the next slide. I'm going to jump about a bit here, sorry. I put these slides in the wrong order. But if we move forward into this slide, we look at um, basically just a awareness raising, creating awareness um, directed towards countries where perhaps sustainable public procurement and certainly circular procurement aren't necessarily everyday practice. And then creating a workshop, a half day workshop aimed at bringing together budget holders, policy makers and the procurement people together um, to actually look at how they can identify priorities in terms of sustainable public procurement and how it can deliver on the circular economy uh, more actively. So that's that level there, level one. 
Um, and then level two is a, a deeper level, a whole day workshop focusing more specifically on the procurement practitioners themselves in terms of how they then take forward those priorities that the higher level workshop and the, the wider group of internal stakeholders have actually uh, developed. And that's what the, that level one workshop, the prioritization workshop is what Turin, what um, Barcelona have, have already gone through. And the aim uh, in the long term is, is then to provide a toolbox and guidance with case studies uh, underpinning and supporting that in terms of information. So I'm just going to flick back very, very briefly. If you're interested in getting uh, a, a basic understanding of how the circular economy works and how circular procurement works, um, the working group did also produce a, a small e-learning primer, which is based on a, a Microsoft um, PowerPoint template uh, that gives you a simple introduction to circular economy and procurement to the lessons learned and then goes through some practical examples as you can see on the screen there through transport, through medical supply, uh, not just of facilities but also of, of the services, of furniture again and, and of construction. And finally, as I mentioned in terms of the, the, the aims at the beginning of the presentation, one of the key bits here is, is about the working group actually moving forward beyond the lifetime and the lifespan that we're coming to an end to of, of the funding through Dutch government and through the 10-year framework program. And the aim to do that is to actually work more closely and to integrate with existing um, interest groups, existing groups in other fields that link into the circular economy. So bringing in the knowledge and the experience and the evidence that we've accumulated through the working group and through the uh, tools and through the workshops and you making those available to other interest groups that have got more longevity. So, you know, our big ambition here is, is to start closing the loop uh, and we, we believe very strongly that the regional scale is the right scale to be working at in terms of linking policy and linking practice together in a way that is achievable in the short term as well as in the medium and long term and by doing that creating a bottom-up uh, groundswell of movement, if you like, for circular procurement to then help deliver those circular economy benefits that the, the wider national governments and pan-international governments are looking to uh, benefit from. So our aim here is, as I said, to work with any interest groups and if there are any interest groups out there already, um, we've already made uh, extended links out to the ICLEI interest group on the circular economy, but if there are others, uh, and you're out there listening to me talking now and you want to get in touch, we'd, we'd be really grateful and, and we'd love to have a dialogue with you. So that's it in terms of the working group update. Um, if you've got any questions, I'll be happy to take those now. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Mervyn, uh, for, for introducing to the activities of the working group 4C. Um, sad to hear that it's coming to an end. I hope uh, that you'll find a way to continue the work that you've been doing uh, this time. And uh, my question, um, well, I have a question for myself and then I'll read you um, a few from the chat as well. Uh, my question is, you, you've mentioned the training that it's available on taking and procurement. Uh, is there any plans to, to have any upcoming uh, training that our audience could take part uh, to? Yeah, I, I think the best response to that, Estella, is, is please get in contact with us because um, you know, we've we've had a limited budget um, within the working group to be able to pilot some of this training um, so that we can get it into a form that we think is you know is going to be widely applicable. Uh, and and of course, you know, it'd be great if we've got other examples that we can use. So. Um, yeah, please get in contact with us and if you're interested in taking up some of this training and, and at the end of a working group we'll be making it available on an internet platform of some description. We're, we're just not sure at this stage what that's going to look like. My own personal view here is it would be better to be co-hosted by an existing platform rather than us creating a new one in addition to all the many different information platforms that are already out there. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have another question. I think it's quite broad. Um, 
it's it's a question about um, why circular procurement and uh, is recycling always preferable? It's a question that comes from the chat. What do you think? Oh, okay, I think there's there's two questions, uh, two parts to that question. I should say why why circular procurement? Um, very very quickly, I, I think when you're talking about um, the provision of goods and services, you have somebody who wants it, the demand side. <coughs> excuse me, and you have somebody who's able to provide it, the supply side. So procurement as a mechanism, whether it's public procurement or whether it's business to business or business to consumer, is an absolutely crucial link between demand and supply in any marketplace. And if we're talking about a circular economy, in essence, we want the market, or we want to encourage the market, in my opinion, to be able to deliver that on our behalf. So it's not up to government to actually create the environment wholly for a circular economy, and it's not up to the supply side. It's a combination and a partnership of the both. So why circular procurement? I think because it is the link between private sector and public sector. It's a link between the consumer and the provider. Um, the second part to that question was around recycling, and I think the waste hierarchy is the best answer to that. If you think about the opportunities, both within procurement and within resource management, preventing waste or rethinking the need is the major priority. That's where you get the most benefit in terms of cost savings, if you're looking to save money. It's where you get the most benefit in terms of reducing the environmental impacts, because if you can do more with less, you're automatically reducing your environmental impact. And let's not forget again all the, the studies that have shown that globally we're using three times our planet's worth of resources into our current consumption rates. And clearly that is unsustainable, particularly when we think about the billions who are going to be emerging into that middle income bracket between now and 2030. We need to think about how we can be more resource efficient and more resilient about the way that we're using our existing resources. So anything that encourages waste prevention is really the primary goal. And then following through from that, if we think about a carbon economy, thinking about the carbon impacts, the more we can keep products and the materials that make those products in a, a functional lifetime in their optimized use over a lifetime, optimizing their product lifetime, for example, with computers or with vehicles or with uh, whatever it is, furniture, then we are uh, keeping that embodied carbon in those products and we're using less carbon as a result. We're you're losing less we're sorry, we're using less CO2 in the creation of new goods and services. So I think there's, you know, it, it's about thinking about the waste hierarchy. So waste, prevent waste, reuse, then recycle. If you can't recycle, then think about energy recovery uh, before you actually put something into landfill at end of life. Many thanks, uh, many thanks, um, Mervyn John, for <laughs> for introducing us to the um, uh, to this presentation. I'm afraid we have to move on. We can answer all the questions uh, in the chat, um, and we have our last presenter of the day, who is Enrico De Giorgi from the Environment from the European Commission. They will share with us the plans that European Commission has in terms of circular economy and green public procurement with all their ongoing work. So, Enrico, if you are listening. Your Tom. I'm not sure if you can hear us. Hello, Enrico. Seems to be a. He seems to have lost him. Okay. In the meantime, maybe, um, Mervyn, we do can <laughs> come back to you with the question that was sure. unanswered from the audience. And it was Is there any actual directive or legislation that it's forcing the linear economy into circular economy in the EU? Um, well, the, the, the European Commission has its circular economy package, and I'd, I'd recommend people go onto the, um, the Commission's website to, to look at what that package entails. Um, it's really, I think, up to the individual member states as to how they set their own priorities, and, and that's really important using the example that the Netherlands uh, have developed since 2010, they've, they've been setting a, a, a really uh, strong focus on delivering the circular economy because they believe that that's a way of, of actually making a more resilient economy within 
the Netherlands. Uh, up in the Scandinavian countries, the Nordic Council of Ministers has been looking at the way that works best for the Nordic countries. And that's why I, I, I go back to a point of setting your own priorities. And that is what we really tried to do with the um, 10 year framework program workshop was to get the cities to set their own priorities because what works for Barcelona might not work for Ghent in Belgium. Um, you know, Ghent in Belgium might have a focus on food that perhaps you know London or Glasgow in in the United Kingdom have, have got a different focus. Theirs might be on construction or on tourism or something. So, the more you can set those priorities at a local level, the more you can make the delivery of a circular economy more applicable. And therefore, the more applicable, the more likely it is to happen. OK, thank you. Well, we could say as well that the new uh, waste directives, which are upcoming, they will, I mean, as they are raising the recycling targets, they kind of force the, the society and all, all governments to try to switch to a more secular way. What do you think about this? Yeah, I, I think there's there's a lot of policy mechanisms. Again, when you're talking about the circular economy, you're talking about a, a principle. And when you're talking about public procurement, you're talking about mechanisms that can deliver on multiple policy goals. So um, improving the well-being of citizens of, of the European member states, um, the social benefits through things like healthier diets, uh, through job creation. These are all part of, of the circular economy. And they're, they're directly and positively linked to each other. If you're just looking at it from an economic perspective, you know, doing more with less saves money. And from a wider environmental perspective, there's all the various different directives and the regulatory requirements about increasing recycling rates, um, but also about, you know, um, in terms of toxicity, reducing toxicity of, of materials and of components used in products so that they have less impact um, both in terms of in-use and uh, at end of life. So for me, circular economy um, is, is, and certainly circular procurement, is about bringing together um, mechanisms that enable multiple policy goals to be delivered, a real opportunity. Yeah, I agree. OK, many thanks. I think we seem to have Enrico back uh, online. So I'll pass the presenter to him. Um, Enrico, I hope you can hear us this time. Yeah, can you hear me? Excellent. Is it working? Yes, yes it okay. is working. OK. OK, hello, so everybody. I already introduced you so you can go ahead <laughs> with your presentation. Yeah. Um, OK, so let's start. I believe that um, at least my first slides are uh, already uh, known from the previous presentation. So also what the European Commission is trying to moving from a linear economy, as uh, it has already been described, to a, circular, a more circular model. And uh, what could be interesting is uh, that uh, an action plan has been published by the European Com Commission the Circular Economy Action Plan was published in, uh, to, in December 2015 with uh, many points on how to do these uh, changes. I will, um, this change. I will focus uh, on the part uh, uh, linked with uh, green public procurement and circular procurement. So what we found in the Circular Economy Action Plan is a key role that uh, is acknowledged to green public uh, procurement uh, for uh, delivery on uh, the circular economy. And, uh, and so the idea is to better integrate and more uh, uh, integrate uh, the circular economy aspect into the uh, development and the setting of uh, EU GPP criteria. Uh, one of the main uh, activities that the Commission is doing to support uh, the, uh, uh, the uptake of uh, GPP and circular procurement is uh, to develop a common EU GPP criteria that uh, could be used at uh, EU level. And uh, so the idea is to integrate, uh, of course, also on these uh, circularity aspects. Um, 
and then to give uh, um, a greater uh, support to, to to GPP and uh, um, especially by by training, and also the circular economy action plan. Uh, recognize uh, uh, the, the, the Commission as to lead by example in, uh, in two ways uh, mainly and uh, one is uh, in integrating be better integrating in its own procurement uh, uh, green and security aspects and the other one is uh, to um, in rein by reinforcing the use of GPP in EU funding and uh, so to, to move on this uh, in uh, starting from uh, April 2016 to inter-service groups uh, internally uh, with the, all the service of the commissions uh, are working on, uh, on this. And we already have uh, some uh, practic uh, practical examples. Uh, uh, for example, in, in the part on the own procurement, the Office uh, for uh, Infrastructure and Logistic uh, in, uh, in Brussels um, um, made a tender for the reuse of uh, all the furniture. So instead of uh, buying new desks and throwing away the old ones, uh, a tender has been prepared to reuse the old desk and uh, office uh, furniture and uh, so reuse all the parts that, uh, especially the wood parts and the metal parts that uh, are, uh, it's, it's possible to, to reuse. And uh, the same has been done uh, in the sector of uh, ITC, with uh, especially in the offices from uh, Brussels and uh, Luxembourg, uh, to reuse and, rec and recycle obsolete uh, ICT. <clears throat> and um, also, as, uh, as I was saying, uh, there is a need to reinforce the circular economy aspect in, develop, in development of uh, GPP criteria. The development of G GPP criteria is a work that is going with a broad consultation with all the stakeholders, and so there is uh, now available uh, uh, about uh, 20 product groups, uh, criteria for 20 product groups, and in the revision of these criteria, um, uh, for example, for uh, computers and monitors, the, the new criteria uh, have been published in October last year, 2016, and uh, so the document is uh, uh, taking into account all the environmental aspects for public procurement uh, with the integration of environmental aspects. And uh, there is uh, um, the, uh, the, the new part is uh, also a, an option for a contract on a renewal on uh, IT equipment, and so not only buying new, but also uh, if, uh, foreseen uh, a renewal of IT equipment. And all the aspects concerning uh, the design for dura durability, upgradability, and reparability all taking into account, for example, with uh, continued uh, availability of spare parts or ease of replacement uh, for rechargeable batteries. But these are only some examples. And uh, the product also criteria for the product lifetime extension upon the end of, of its service life and the design for dismantling and end-of-life manage management to maximize the recovery of resources. The, um, on my slide, uh, you can find the, the link to download the, the entire document that, of course, go much more into the detail uh, compared to what I can say here. Uh, some other examples of how uh, circular economy aspects are taking into account in GPP criteria development or link or, for example, for furniture, where uh, uh, refurbish, refurbishment service uh, is foreseen for uh, existing uh, used furniture, and uh, criterion on uh, easy repair, including spare part uh, availability. And the same is uh, for construction, for example, with criteria to encourage the uh, use of recycle, recycled materials, and for example, on the um, ongoing process for the uh, 
development of uh, GPP for food and uh, catering services, where one of the main uh, issues is linked with uh, food waste uh, prevention, which is one of the key areas that are recalled in the EU circular economy action plan. Um, uh, it's possible to be involved in the development of these GPP criteria, and uh, on my slide you can find the, the, the link uh, to, to, to which it's possible to um, <coughs> register as an interested stakeholder. Uh, the higher support uh, for GPP will uh, continue to take place and uh, will uh, in, in the next in the coming months, uh, especially with activities on training to support training and the organisation uh, of uh, training on uh, on these technical assistance assistance, for example, through the GPP help desk, uh, European GPP help desk that uh, is uh, is available, and uh, we foresee also activities uh, in peer to peer. Uh, learning. Uh, this was uh, the news that uh, I, I wanted to, to give. It has been an anticipated, uh, and I'm happy to to, to say that uh, in uh, yes, in Tallinn, as said, as already said by Mervin, uh, as the second uh, International Circular Procurement Co Congress will be uh, will take place. So please uh, save the date. It will be the uh, 19th and uh, it will be the, the occasion to, to meet and share examples, experiences, and uh, to discuss now uh, to better work on circular procurement. And with this, uh, I can close uh, giving my uh, contact, and uh, uh, of course you can visit the GPP web, web page where a lot of material is uh, available. And, so thank you. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you also for making it short <laughs> because we were a little <laughs> over the time. We did receive, though, um, a couple of questions that I would like to ask you. The first question in the chat in, refers to, uh, has any criteria been set for textile product groups? If not, are there any plans for this? Uh, for uh, textile, the, the work already started uh, some time ago and the criteria are uh, supposed to be uh, officially approved uh, very soon. So the, the work, uh, yes, it's uh, almost uh, uh, done. All the material that uh, has been uh, produced in the framework of this uh, revision is available on the website of uh, the Joint Resource Center, so the DG service that uh, is uh, in charge of the development of the criteria, especially for the um, uh, scientific uh, part. So all this material is, uh, is available and it's possible to be updated of, on uh, what is happening, uh, registering on, the, on this website. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question and it's, um, can you tell us which criteria are currently under development or revision? Which product groups and service groups? Yeah, uh, the, the, the work just uh, started for the uh, development uh, or revision, in particular for uh, data centers criteria. Uh, for public spaces, uh, uh, which means uh, yeah, it will be decided exactly what the scope is. Part of the work is uh, defining the scope of uh, the, the product group. And the last one uh, is um, imaging equipment. So for this, the, the work just started. And uh, the, the others, uh, product group that are uh, on the revision or development or uh, or food and catering services, and uh, street lighting and transport. So these are the main area or, of activities on which uh, the Commission is uh, currently working on. Many thanks. Also re uh, regarding circular, the circular economy action plan that you uh, briefly mentioned, um, I would like to ask you, and that's uh, come from my side, uh, <laughs> the, the question, and I hope it's okay. Um, what have been defined 
as the main key deliverables for 2017. Now, there was a review of the circular economy action plan. Some activities have happened uh, in the past year. What do you think is going to be the main priority for the European Commission in the next um, years? Yeah, uh, there are so many activities following under the, the framework of the circular economy action plan that it's a bit difficult to uh, recall them uh, all. Uh, but uh, they, there are activities linked with uh, the waste, with the new directives that are currently under discussion. Uh, there are uh, aspects on, uh, um, I, I recall the ones that I uh, have in mind. There are aspects linked with, uh, for example, the construction sector with uh, demolition and uh, the recovery of waste uh, demolition. And also one of the biggest uh, strengths is uh, uh, with all the activities uh, following under the eco-design uh, directive, so the development and the revision of uh, uh, the rules, uh, the product group's rules uh, following under the <coughs> eco-design directive that will not mm, be only on the energy part, but also they will take into account the part on the reuse of material and so efficiency on resource. And, and of course, the platform on food waste is one of the activities. But yes, there are, there are a lot of things going on, so to have a full overview, uh, <laughs> it's, okay. it's better to consult yes, the, the, the Europa website uh, on circular economy to have a the full overview. Thank you very much. We had, um, well, just the last question, we're two minutes um, running uh, out of time, but I hope you will, you will forgive me. I think Barbara wanted to add something to your um, answer on the textile question. Barbara, oh. are you there? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Uh, no, I was just listening uh, to Enrico and um, uh, I'm going to check because we just did an update here in the Netherlands um, uh, and I'm going to check if this is the same update or not. If not, uh, we have some uh, very uh, well usable criteria available for public procurement of textile. Oh, but excellent. I will send that later then, okay? That's very good. Excellent. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Enrico. Thank you to all our panelists today thank and thank you all for participating in the webinar. Um, as we said in the chat, well, before I finalize it, I think Mervin has made available a link to the case study on the Polish um, uniforms that someone was asking about, so you can check that there. And also, um, just to let you know, we have recorded the webinar and we will be uploading it to um, several platforms, so you can either rewatch it um, or get the presentation more, more in detail or share it with people that you think might find it interesting. interesting. Um, these platforms will be the Rebus website, the ECAP website, they have all been mentioned in the presentations, and also the Sustainable Procurement Platform. We'll add a new feed there um, and you will be able to download the recording and all the presentations that were shown today. I hope that you enjoyed the webinar and that you can take home some valuable information, also some contact people that you know are working on the topic and can be approached um, if, if you would need to. And well, I hope that we, look, uh, we really see each other again and, and that you can work on the topic a little bit more motivated and inspired. Thank you everyone and have a nice day.